I think we can start building some something. So, in the particles folder, I just create a new particle called explosion one. Place it here. We'll just start very basic with a generic glow, something exploding like. Uh, it's going to be just one sprite. We're going to build this from scratch so you know how to do this by your own. Because, as I said, the presets are basically just the same kind of node with different constellation. What we have now is we have a sprite, and what we have is spawn rate. This is not what we want. We want, don't want a rate. A rate implies that you keep spawning it over time. So what we want is uh, we just add a feature, uh, spawn count. And we just delete the rate. And we exchange it for count. The amount will be 1. The delay will be 0, because it should happen immediately. Duration is also 0, because we want to happen it instantly. Uh, we don't want to make it keep happening. So the duration can be 0. Uh, we can have this, the, the restart enabled. If you have the restart set to 0, it will do it every frame. So maybe you want it to have like every two seconds. So you spawn the thing, and it has a lifetime of one. So it stays there for one second, and then it disappears. And then uh, after two seconds, the cycle begins again. The restart is just for working purposes right now. Of course, we don't want to, the explosion to restart later on. Uh, we just disable it. Now, lifetime of one seems pretty long for just a flash or a glow. Uh, we can have it to like 0.15 or something. So it's just like a flash. And on the size, we're just going to add a curve over H. Basically, we just want it to start at 0, go up, and just go down again. So we have this flashy thing. This, of course, should not be a square, or it should be way bigger, maybe, even. So we have scale 5. And what we need to do is, uh, in the appearance, uh, in the lighting, we want to make it glow. So this is one of the cases where we want it to glow. So we just give it emissive 50. So it's a white thing that glows. But now we don't want it to be a square. Uh, we add the feature appearance material. And we just pick a texture. And textures, uh, because we're in Game SDK, we already have some sets of textures. Um, in sprites, are pretty much all the textures you will need for particles. Uh, there is a folder glow. And now we can pick any glow. It's, we can have the flare, the star sh looking like, or the, the, uh, the round one, just glow A. Uh, you, can have, you can, of course, later on make your own custom glows. And we just made this one, uh, took this one, the glow A. And as you can see, it has a black outline. And this is coming uh, from the fact that it uses alpha blend still by default, uh, but it does not have an alpha. So we can change to appearance opacity. And we switch from alpha to additive. And now we just created this glowy thing. There's also one thing, once you add opacity, it uh, gives you one option. So basically, imagine this, this explosion would happen somewhere on this stone. You can see how there's going to be a clear edge, because the sprite, sprite intersects with this rock. Uh, you maybe don't want this to happen. Uh, in, in the opacity, you will get an option soft intersect. If you set it to some number that is higher than zero, it will soften this edge on objects. So basically, um, if I disable this, maybe uh, you can see it better if I do it actually. 
So see how this this glow now actually is very soft. If you set it to zero, it will just clip. So you don't want that. You want on most of the things that are very big, you want to have some some kind of soft intersect. It can be 0.1 or something. So it's it can be very uh, very little, uh, but it can be also 0.5 or it's basically the value is depending on how big your sprite is. So it, if it's set to one, it will start blending with the same radius as you as it w with is. Uh, maybe you also want to offset this a bit in camera direction, because imagine it it's happening over there and you want to offset it a bit in camera distance, so the the glow doesn't does come a bit further over the stone. Uh, in this, in the render sprites, there is a camera offset value, and if you go negative with this, it will move the sprite towards the camera when it spawns. So it's always better to have some some kind of glow a bit f closer to you, so it's not actually just clipping away from the point where it is. Uh, so it, it it looks a bit more like it's a volume. You can also achieve this offset by having a very complex modifier stack. This is just a very simple way to move something towards the camera. And this does not give you much control, but if you do it the com complex way and do it you know, manually, you have way more control about how much you actually offset this. So yeah, I'm gonna put this uh, to back to the value. So. W we can be quite happy already with this. This uh, does not need any further tweaking. Uh, we save, of course. Just be sure to always save. <laughs> now we want some explosion fire, basically. So we want some something that, some material that burns uh, during the explosion. And there is a preset for this. If you search for fire, there is explosion fire, and it will do like th like it did for me here when I enabled it. It did it once and kept doing whatever I was doing before. This comes now with, with the thing is, even if I do the restart here to two, they are still not in sync. They start at the different times and now they're doing something like, they, they restart every two seconds, but they don't do it in sync. And now we have to make sure that they stay in sync. This is not really a problem yet with this kind of particle uh, because usually if you spawn the explosion somewhere in the code or something, something spawns the explosion, it gets enabled. So now both things are in sync again. But um, to make sure that when you work, uh, these things stay in sync, uh, we just gonna introduce a new component and it can be any kind of thing. There will be new presets where I have a time up preset, but you can basically use the, the default sprite. That's totally fine. And now we're gonna just make these things children of this sprite and we disable the sprite component. And now we remove the restart from the children. Now I can change the rate, maybe make it 5, make it flash a lot, or make it 0.1. It's particles per second, so now we have 0.1 particles per second, it's not many, 0.5. So we are back to every 2 seconds. We can also use count or rate, it doesn't matter here now. But now we have something, some kind of timer that keeps this stuff in sync. And we can continue working, uh, because now changing stuff uh, will always give us the result that we actually want to look at. Also, this kind of things is uh, it's not only working. If you do something more complex of a particle, it's very hard to tell when a component actually starts because it can start in different times. Uh, you can have uh, different attributes that control different component starting times. So there is no such thing as uh, we could offer you a timeline because a timeline does not exist inside a particle, they can start at different timings. They are allowed to. So there is no certain sequence that they play. They, they can start at certain timings. Okay, so now we added this explosion fire 
and uh, I do have a typo in it. I know ex it's explosion file. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, very upset about this. <laughs> we can look through it, what it actually does, so we understand what the, the, the preset does. Um, so it does rendering sprites. It's still the same. We can additionally add some offset as well, maybe, so it, it will not always clip through everything. It does have a count. We just spawn 10 of them over zero seconds. They stay for one second in lifetime. So we can extend that as depending on the sprite that we have. The new component that it has, it has angles rotate 2D. It just has some random rotation. It just random angle 180 degrees. It can be anything between 180 and minus 180. It has no spin. We can later on see if if it has some details when we spin the, spin the texture. It has a size, regular curve. It scales up and then a bit down. It does the same for opacity. It fades away after a time. And on the lighting, right now it does not have emissive, but we will add some uh, because it's fire. It should have some emissive. On the material, there is nothing. It's ready to be used. Texture tiling is also ready to be used. Uh, on the f motion physics part, it does have some negative gravity and it does have some drag. Uh, the drag is mostly because there is a velocity omnidirectional and all velocity features that you find in add feature velocity, uh, all of them are just the initial velocity. So they will not act over time. So it's only when the particle happens, we set the velocity to go in a certain direction and with a certain magnitude. and then this feature will never do anything again with the particle. From there on, other systems take over, and this is how the motion physics has a drag. If I set the drag to zero, you will see that it will keep going into the direction the ve initial velocity kicked it. Uh, but if we set the drag to two, uh, we can even ramp up the velocity maybe to, to three or something. So we can spread them a bit more. But these values we should tweak after we apply the texture. So now we go into material. And we go into, uh, we go, gonna pick a texture again. And inside the same folder, uh, game SK texture sprites, uh, there should be a folder called fire. There it is. We do have some explosion fires here. Fireball, yeah, this one's fine. We can already see here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's probably going to be an 8x8 texture. Ideally, I would recommend if you save this kind of textures, you put in the name the tiling as well, so you don't have to count. <laughs> I always name my textures Fireball 8x8. Eight eight. So now it, all, of course, looks bad because it's just this repeated texture there. So in, extra in texture tiling, uh, we set this to 8x8. Eight eight. And now in tile count, it would be uh, 8 times 8. You can just type in any math operation into uh, the input fields. You just press enter and it tells you 8 times 8 is 64. So for this one it would be easy to calculate. Some are not just like popping out of my head. I just type in whatever I have there. So now it does the same thing as I explained before. It has a tile count of 64 but it picks random one. Uh, but we don't want it, we want to play the whole sequence, so we also type in 64 in frame count, and now we play the explosion animation over the whole time. We may don't want them to fly that far, so we put velocity 1.5 again. Now we, what we can do is to give some time variation on it, so they don't stay as long as every other sprite, so there's some variation on it, and on the time, on the lifetime, we can add a random, and we can put in any kind of number in this in the random field between one and two. Two will go into negative. One will be completely random. But basically, what it does is, if your lifetime is one, or it can be on any other thing, it can be on size, on 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 color, or whatever. A random of zero will not deviate from this number at all. A random of one will deviate from the number completely towards zero. So it can be any number between zero and the number you put in. So in lifetime, it would be from zero to one. 
if you go a random of two, it will go into negative numbers. So it will be twice as random, basically, and it will go to minus one. So it will be a number between minus one and one. And if you go 0.5, it will be uh, in between minus 0.5 and 1. It's a bit weird for, for some things, but it does make sense in certain other ways to think about it. But yeah, basically, we don't want complete randomness here. We want just 0.5 maybe. So some sprites do live for half a second, some sprites do live for one second. And you already, already see that you get some variation out of it. So not everything plays with the same speed. And this is because in the animation of the texture tiling, we set it to once. And this means that the frame count will be reached by the end of the lifetime of the sprite. So once the lifetime is going to be disappearing, it will definitely reach frame 64. We can do a loop or a mirror, or we can set it to once. If the frame rate is zero, this will be always be the case. If the frame rate is anything than zero, maybe it's 80, which is quite a lot. So now all the sprites play with 80 frames a second. And, and not all of them end on the same frame. They all start at the same frame, because we set them up to be uh, always at the same frame. And they keep playing with 80 frames a second, so in the end they are playing the same speed, which we don't want in this case. In some cases it's useful. Uh, to have a certain speed because your lifetime variation is very big and then you would notice that one animation is playing way faster than the other one uh, so you would type in the frame rate uh, for this we want this kind of variation so some some things are faster than others the only thing that's missing is maybe it also should have some emissive so it has some glow otherwise for fireball that's totally fine already now we are missing some smoke. This, we can just copy the fireball, just copy paste the whole node, make it the child again of the same parent, and we just disable the emissive, and we pick a different sprite, and we pick just some, uh, with control and uh, the mouse wheel, you can zoom in on the textures, which is quite useful in these texture sprites, and we can pick pretty much any smoke that is animated, yeah, smoke test diff ex exclusive 30. I cannot stress this enough. Please make sure you name your files correctly. <laughs> this is not helpful at all. <laughs> yeah, it's nine, 9 times 9. You will see what happens if you have the wrong texture tiling in it. If I solo this, you can see this is not correct. And when I set the texture tiling to 9 times 9, now we have some smoke. And again, 9 times 9 is 81. We want 81. And on this one, we want the lifetime to be a bit longer, maybe 5 seconds. And maybe we don't want uh, the gravity to be affecting it so much. Maybe the velocity should not be that high. We also notice the smoke is basically in front of the fire and just covering it completely. And it doesn't look that great because of that. Also, we maybe tweak our rate a bit lower so the smoke has some time to disappear before we start a new one. What we can do about this thing, and this comes into uh, the problem of sorting particles. So basically, you cannot mix particles like meshes, so you can't have like, oh, I have 10 smokes here, and I have 10, uh, 10 fires here, and they all are mixed together. So it's always, there's the fire, and there's the smoke, and we render one after each other. So one of them has to be on top of it. You can't mix them. Oh, unless you go opaque, then you lose transparency. So um, that's just the limitation of how uh, rendering of uh, transparent things works. So how you can control this, though, is in the render sprite feature, there is a, a field called sort, sort bias, which is uh, by default set to zero. And you can type in any positive or negative numbers in there. And the higher numbers will be on top. 
So by default is zero, you will get something that the system decides. They just like go in sequential order of what the components are added to. And they will just like, now I added the smoke after the fire, that's why the smoke is on top. If I want the smoke to be on top, I maybe, or I want the smoke to be behind everything. Uh, I just set it to minus maybe minus 10. So I make sure it's behind things. Wait. I restart this. Yeah. So if it doesn't update for you, the sort bias, uh, you can just disable the node and enable it again. It will do this update. So now the smoke is always behind the fire. This uh, also looks quite unnatural because the smoke is now smaller than the fire was in the beginning. So we maybe want to add a feature, location, uh, sphere, which is way too much right now. <laughs> So on the sphere, the radius should be 0.25 or something. It's a very small explosion. And uh, we don't need additional velocity from the sphere modifier. The velocity omnidirectional will pick a random omnidirectional vector to push the thing. Now, when you introduce a sphere, a sphere location, you basically uh, you spawn sprites on the sphere. If you do a random velocity on them, it can happen that the, the thing that spawned here like I'm the center of the sphere. Uh, if something spawned away from me on the, on the sphere, it will be pushed towards me because it's a random vector. It can be anywhere. Because the velocity feature is not aware of the sphere feature. They don't have to do anything with each other. And sometimes you want this random thing to happen. So now we're going to disable the velocity direction. And inside the location sphere, we have actually a velocity. So if we just use the velocity in the sphere, it will always make sure that it always pushes outside the sphere. It's always going away from the center. So this will distribute the smoke a bit more equally. Now, of course, velocity one is, in my case, a bit too high again. I add some random on it, random of one, and maybe it's 0.5 or something. And there you go. Your fire turns into smoke. And with further tweaking, you can make it look really nice. Uh, we won't spend too much time on tweaking this. One more trick that can be used is we copy the smoke part. And ideally, you would use some kind of different texture for it. But I'm using the same one right here. I give it a sort bias of plus 10 to make sure it's, um, it's always on top. Now it's covering this, uh, the fire again. But we only spawn like maybe two of them and make it less time and now we can, you can see that the fire kind of is behind the smoke but also in front of the smoke you also have some smoke patches above the fire which is also a bit randomized but yeah so this is how you basically would set up a basic explosion you have smoke fire smoke or the simplest way to be to do this you have one sprite that does everything for this already. You, you, you have some fume effects simulation or whatever that has everything already in one sprite. But then you also lose volume and everything. Because you, for, a big ex for a small explosion, one sprite is fine. Uh, but if you actually want to cover area with smoke, you have to spawn a lot. And it has to, uh, has to be a volume. And then you, you don't get away with one sprite anymore. Especially for long-lasting smoke, if you want some realistic smoke after explosion, it has to stay for a long time. Usually, you would also this beginning smoke would then transition into a long-lasting smoke. So you have one more component that's an, a, a third smoke that has a very long lifetime, and you spawn it behind it. So basically, the one in front dissolves and it goes into this really sm slow-moving uh, smoke. Looks already nice. We can add some sparks. There's also in advance, there's explosion sparks, which is pretty much the same thing again. I think it does not introduce new features. Uh, it just has a very high initial velocity and it's just tiny things. You can map any kind of glow dot or whatever to it. It can be debris. It's pretty much uh, up to you how to do them. It's really nothing new. It's, uh, it has some physics, it has some gravity, it has some drag that increases over time. So in the beginning, they are free to move and then they slow down a bit with drag. 
it has very high velocity, five meters per second. Oh, by the way, everything is kind of in meters and meters per second values. So uh, if you see velocity of five, it means five meters per second. And yeah, they have, uh, they have size, they're very small, they fade away, rotate to D, pretty much uh, not important how they are rotated because they're so small anyway. And yeah, they, they spawn 100 of them uh, at zero time. So nothing new, pretty much the same thing, it's just in small and no texture animation on it. Let's add a light because uh, right now this thing maybe glows and everything, but when you look to the side, nothing is illuminated. So we just add a component, default light. And by default, this will just continuously flash because it has a rate. It does it infinitely long, once per second. We can disable the rate and enable the count. The count has one with duration zero. And we just link it again to our master thing. Now we have some light. You can see it does illuminate the scene a bit. It really depends on how strong you want it to be. Right now, it's of course way too uh, long. It should be like 0.5 seconds maybe. Maybe it should have some yellowish, orange tone. And because it has no offset or anything, it's just at the center. It's not a volumetric glow or something. And now the thing is, lights can be controlled by two values over time. Um, so the light component, uh, you, can, you can find it in add features light uh, and there's a light component. So if you want to add it yourself, but this one has it already. It has an intensity, which is 500. It's probably lumen. I'm not sure. Radius clip, you can make it clip for certain meters. So it's just like, oh, it's, it should not go further than five meters or something. Because when you make something really glowing a lot, it will also have a big radius, of course, by default. And if you spawn a lot of them, it can lead into performance issues. So if you just spam every particle with a lot of lights, which lights should be very uh, subtly used. Uh, you should not spawn a light on every spark that you spawn. Uh, you should kind of group them together uh, some, somehow smartly. So radius clip does give you a bit of control to clip the radius of the light. Effect fog is if it should affect the volumetric fog. If it's not, it will not illuminate the fog. If it's, you can also say, I want to illuminate fog only. So it doesn't actually illuminate the area, but only the fog. Uh, it gives you the benefit of you can add two lights. One affects the fog only and one affects the area. And you can tweak them differently. Usually you set it to both. Affect this area only is uh, important if you set up this areas and everything. And you can add a flare, which I'm not sure if it works. This is the, the static part, basically. You, you have an intensity. Uh, but now you want to animate it. And this goes over opacity. So the opacity feature will basically modify how much it will glow over time. You want it to have maybe something like this. And then maybe you even add like some noise in the end. So it's maybe a bit too fast. Give it a bit more time. And yeah, when, when I make the color a bit more obviously orange, maybe move this in some dark area so we can see that it does something. This fake noise would be basically, uh, in the end, make it look like the fire is still emitting and not just the, the blast. So design choice again. You can also just have like a very short spike of light and nothing else anymore. There is another thing, the size uh, will do affect bulb size, which is uh, kind of a fakey way of how big your light source is. If it's set to zero, it's a point light, basically. If it's one, it considers that the light source is kind of one, one meter wide. So it does shade the objects a bit differently because you have different shading on objects when, the point, when you have a really pointy light or if your light source is bigger, you get different shading. You, you don't get like soft shadow or whatever. That's like way too hard to calculate uh, in real time. But this, just be aware that the, the size does affect this. This applies also on all light sources. They have bulb size. 
Now we have some light, we have smoke, we have one thing that I'm not sure if I have here, the assets, but we can add an audio. So basically it's again default, uh, I already prepared the audio, uh, otherwise there is just like an audio feature. Uh, and it does spawn one audio, but we don't say what it is. And we can look for, maybe we have some explosion in the X SDK. Essentially, it's, it's like this. You, you just have a component with an audio trigger in there. You tell it what, to, uh, what audio to play, and that's pretty much it. Uh, we don't need that. Now what we could add is uh, some streaks. That you have some, some things that fly off, and they, they pull some smoke behind them which uh, would uh, add a new technique, how to use ribbons, basically. Essentially, we can reuse some things again. I just reuse the sparks. I copy-paste them again. I make them a child again of the thing. Now we have double, double amount of sparks, and we just give them a bit bigger things so we actually see the new ones. So we have some glowy parts that flow away. And we just give it a, some kind of glowy texture. Uh, it can be, yeah, some glowy orb. Uh, size maybe 0 0.05, so it does look like something. The count is, of course, way too much. I don't want that many blobs. It's up to you, of course, if you w don't want them. So we have 15. Now we have something that could leave a smoke trail. Uh, of course, I can give it some field color, so it does has some color. And now what we can do is attach a trail to it, and there is a preset for trail already. Essentially, it's just a ribbon that keeps spawning over distance. And now we make this a child of it and we will see it will leave a trail. Uh, it's very small because in the size you will see that it has inherit. It does inherit the size of its parent, uh, which we can, we can keep, but then it, it multiplies it by 0.1. So we want to keep it at one. So we have some smoky trails. Uh, right now they're just white. Of course, we change the material and we go into smoke. And in the smoke, there is a smoke trail, smoke trail A can also choose smoke trail B, depending of how do you want it to look like. And what you also do is uh, the texture is going top to bottom. That's how the ribbon is uh, basically tiled. So it could be an infinitely long ribbon and you map it from top to bottom basically. So it can tile itself. It can uh, have infinitely many of these patches tiled on top of each other. This is basically determined in the render ribbon. Let me make them quite big so you can actually see what they do. And also don't alter their size. You can see right now they are quite stretched and they keep smearing away. Uh, we can change the mode from not to age, but to spawn. And for this one, uh, spawn will not work with the distance because distance does not have a finite amount of uh, count. So ideally we would have spawn rate or count uh, with a duration. So we say we do this for two seconds. We can ramp up the texture frequency now in the ribbon. So the texture frequency basically says over the whole lifetime of the thing, use the texture 10 times. So it will keep tile it 10 times. Um, if you set the stream source to spawn, if you set the stream source to age, it will shift the texture 10 times over the thing. It's essentially, uh, think of it, it's just UV mapping. You basically have a texture and the, you have certain points that you spawn and you just shift them over the UV of the texture sheet. And either you squeeze them and you fit more or like you stretch them and you fit more of the texture in, so you have texture tiling in going on there, or you, sh you can shift them over time. So you, it looks like the smoke is going in some way. Uh, if you want the smoke just to stand still, you have to use spawn, 
and then any kind of texture frequency that works. And now you can see that your texture will do the thing that you asked it for. Also, you can see on the inherit, there is a thing, uh, there's a checkbox spawn only. So maybe you don't want the smoke to scale down when the parent is scaled down. So you want to enable spawn only. If you want the inherit at all, you can just disable the inherit. You don't need that. You can have a fixed size of 0.1 or whatever. Also, you can have some age curve, so it scales over age. And now we want to fade out the smoke. So the further away the, the, the balls fly, the, the less visible the smoke gets, basically. How to achieve that is uh, there's multiple ways, depending on how you want to do it or what is needed for your setup. But I can show you just one. And I'm going to switch to spawn count because it's easier to explain with the count, but it does work with the rate as well, because the rate is essentially doing the same with, as the count. It's just different terms and different ways. So the duration was still two seconds. We want to have the smoke for two seconds. And we want, let's say, 50 points. So we spawn 50 points that we connect to each other over two seconds. And now we can, uh, because we have a finite amount, uh, we don't have a rate that continues, uh, continuously growing and we have like infinite things. We can have something called spawn fraction. So we can animate things not over age anymore. Uh, we, we, can, we can still do it, uh, but we can, we can switch to spawn fraction. And what it will do is spawn fraction will be now, zero will be the first particle it spawned of the 50 and one will be the last one. So you have a timeline now that represents the beginning and the, the end of the ribbon. And this is not only for the ribbons, this is also for sprites and everything. Everything that has a finite amount can be addressed with a spawn fraction. Actually, with 5.6, there is a new system that's a bit more complex to explain, which also allows you to do this with infinite amounts, defining a certain range. Uh, but this is way more advanced to use. If we do it on the opacity curve and we change from age to spawn fraction, we can have something. Oh, there is one mistake I did. The parent of this, the explosion sparks, the duplicator that I did, the glow parts, they only live for one second. So when I do my opacity curve here and I want to do this, this means uh, because I have a count of two seconds, I will never reach the two seconds. I will never reach the end of this because the parent dies one second in the process. And once the parent died, it will not continue to spawn child. So you will never reach spawn fraction one with this kind of setup. You would need to allow the parent to live as long as you spawning. So ideally you would give also a bit more of space. So it would be maybe two and then uh, the duration here is 0.5 or something. You don't want to con continuously spawn. Or we can go to one and see how this would go. But now, as you can see, our size and opacity curve does kick in. We keep the size a bit up. And we want also the size to be big in the beginning. But to hide the fact that it looks like a bit shitty there when it intersects, uh, we can just have the opacity come in way later. So the streaks look like they're outside the smoke. So in, in the beginning, they're just like transparent and they fade away. And um, of course, uh, you would tweak it with lighting and color, field color. You will make it. You want to make them a bit, a bit darker to fit the smoke. One very obvious one is how they fade away, because they don't. Uh, they just get eaten up from a uh, lifetime. This is because we removed the age curve on the opacity, and we replaced it with a spawn fraction. What we can also do is, um, on the value, we can just add a new curve. So we have just two curves now. And one is H and one is spawn fraction. And then as we go towards H1, which is the end of the lifetime, 
we just go down in opacity. And this is how it then looks like. Uh, we can also give it a bit more time. So we have, they stand a bit and we can also give them a bit more, uh, oh, that's too much gravity with a lot of drag. And you see I increase drag, this, this does stop the gravity a bit, but it also pushes it to the side. It comes from, uh, the level does have wind. Particles do react to wind once you give them drag. So your smoke will be pushed away from the wind. You can also have wind volumes where you have certain directions. Uh, there's wind volume entities where you can place and then will push particles in certain direction if you want them to react to this. If you don't want them to react and say like this explosion should never just drift away, uh, you just go into the wind uh, in, the, in the physics. There is a level wind scale, just set it to zero. Now they will not react to wind anymore. Maybe you also want some, some kind of uh, turbulence motion. In the motion physics, you can add some turbulence. This will look very bad <laughs> if you do just a Brownian turbulence on it which is just random directions for every point. It can be fixed though. You can switch the turbulence mode to simplex. Now you can see you, you get some wavier motions. This will give you some more options here. Uh, so the speed, you don't want them to move that crazy. Um, the size is basically the size of your turbulence field. So it's, uh, you have some some noise like turbulence vectors, they do rotate and how big this field are, like how big the differences are, you, you scale with the size. So if you, if you have size 50 uh, and let's say I have a lot of speed, so now you will see there is almost no difference in them because the field is so big that every meter you go is almost no difference in, in, the, in the noise. Uh, but if you have size 0.2 or something very small, you get almost to complete noise again. Now with some size setup, you will get some interesting turbulences. The speed is of course way too big. So we tweak it a bit, uh, doesn't matter now. The rate is basically, right now the, this field is static. It doesn't change, the turbulence field. So every time a particle is in this location, it always gets pushed in this certain direction. There is no change in it. If you, if you give it a rate, one is really high, it will start to, to move more like it's in a liquid or something that has some turbulence in itself, and it will start to move things in, in a quite natural way. Right now, we only spawn the smoke directly at the point that we're moving. Uh, we could give it a velocity that pushes it away from, from a certain angles or whatever. Uh, but we also could just add a feature, location noise. And when we look at this, uh, this will go absolutely crazy. <laughs> uh, the amplitude is set to one, so it's, it's always a meter away from the thing that we're actually tracking. So it's, it's somewhere moving. Uh, we don't want it to be that hard, yeah, 0.5. And if we size is again the same concept, uh, this noise is a, again some, some uh, vector field and you can scale the vector field. So the, the bigger the size is, the less change you get pro over distance. So maybe it's two, maybe the rate is like five because it's fast moving, then it doesn't matter. And see, you, get, you, you start to get this swirly patterns uh, that you maybe want, you maybe don't want them, you maybe want to scale them. The amplitude you can scale again over a curve with the spawn fraction. So you maybe in the beginning you have a lot of curly stuff, but then in the end you have way less curly stuff. So it's really up to you how to do this. And you can you can stack the location features. You can stack as infinitely of them. You can have like another location offset maybe, and you just always offset it by one. Uh, in, in Y axis for whatever reason you want to do that, but you can. <laughs> uh, this always is the offsets. It's always in parent space. So if you 
offset something by one meter on y-axis, it's on the y-axis of the parent. If the parent is aligned to the world, you will shift in the world. If the parent is aligned to velocity, you will shift on his alignment, basically. So if the parent is rotated in any way, you will always move in his space. Except the noise. The noise is a world modifier. Just because it's a hard concept to clamp into different spaces. Uh, so the noise and turbulence are world space, always. Now the thing is, if we have to think close to something, give them a bit more velocity. So yeah, they're obviously clip clipping through walls. And this is because we did not tell them different. So right now they are not aware of the world at all, but we can add a feature, motion, collision, and now they will collide with the world. They will bounce off walls. Uh, inside the collision, we can set them what they should collide with. Is it terrain, uh, static objects, dynamic objects, which recommend not to enable. Uh, it gets expensive. Uh, essentially, collisions you should avoid as much as you can. Like they just add up in your in your ray costs. Although these particle collisions are cheap because they are just sim simple point collisions, so you don't have a rigid body. They are quite cheap, so they they consider only ray costs. But you should not use them on like if you have an explosion that spawns like hundreds of uh, sparks. You should not enable collision on the sparks. Uh, there is smarter ways to do that. You can uh, group sparks. So you have some, maybe 10 spark groups that are just distributed equally in a sphere. And they have collision. And then they bounce off walls. And then after a certain time, you spawn more sparks in the same direction as they fly. So you basically had collision before. You checked for collision. And then they just fly off with, there is going to be hundreds of them. They will clip through things, but they most likely will not clip anymore because they already check collision with some less groups. So some advanced techniques there. It's really up to if you have performance issues, you should consider reducing collisions in general. So then an object, uh, you can collide with water. Elasticity is basically the bounciness of the object. If you set it to one, it will bounce off with the same velocity as it came in. Uh, there is no energy loss, basically. If you want something realistic, it's like up to 0 0.5, 0 0.2, maybe, I don't know. Um, friction is when it slides, how much it loses, can be anything. Collisions limit mode. You can choose what to do with the co after, after collision happened. Uh, do you want to bounce them unlimitedly? Uh, do you want to ignore collisions after a certain amount of thing? You see, I switch to ignore. There should be an option popping up here. Another UI bug. Just deselect the collision and select it again. You will get a new option there. So some things do not update properly here. So if you set uh, to ignore, it will, after it collided once, it will not do any collisions anymore. Some optimizations there. You can, you can have like five collisions, and then after five collisions, it doesn't do anymore. It will just go through any wall. Or you can say stop. It will just kill its velocity completely. So it will bounce in the wall and then it just stop. Right now you see them still moving. It's because there's actually still physics and uh, some turbulence and gravity pulling them down. But basically they lost all their velocity and then physics starts pulling them down again. Or you can kill them. So once they bounce in the wall, they just disappear. In this case, maybe, maybe OK, maybe you want them to bounce off. Then rotate to normal. I do this a free-facing tile, and I have it really big. So now they all fly away. And if I do rotate to normal, it will align them to the normal of whatever it hit. And it will stay in this rotation until it hits something else. This is especially helpful for if you want to spawn something on a collision. So basically, you, you have some debris hitting a wall or something. And then you want to spawn maybe sparks on this wall. But you want to, of course, align to the wall. You don't want to just omnidirectionally spray in every direction. You want to only shoot things out. So you basically 
just create this hierarchy of I have something collided and I can show you right now uh, how to do that. So basically if you have a sprite or whatever, it doesn't matter what, let me set this back to camera. And now we want to see all the collision points where they collided. So I make this a child of, of it. Now I add a feature. There is a child component, uh, child feature. And I add on collide. Now this component will not automatically spawn when the parent is spawned. This component will only spawn when a collision happened. And if you set this one to free, and your, your parent had a line to normal on, then you will see that you will basically get the orientation of the wall or whatever you collided with. And now from here on, you can start the fire at the location. So you give it a bit more time, maybe two seconds. And now everywhere it collided, it starts burning. And because you know the orientation of the normal, you can distribute it equally and not clipping through walls or whatever. This is how you do Molotov cocktails, basically. From the impact where it happened, you just spray a lot of collisions and you keep bouncing them off. And everywhere where they collide with something, you spawn a patch of fire. And you could make this uh, ray cast basically invi <coughs> invisible by not having a blob attached to it, but just disable the rendering component. And then you have invisible ray casts spraying everywhere and they just spawn fire. So you can have fire distribution going like this. There's also ways to detect collision. I'm not sure if this one will be registered by entities in code. There is a different one. Basically, right now we used, uh, on this one, we used motion collision, but there is also motion cryphysics. The cryphysics will allow you, uh, allow you to use particle or mesh collisions. If your component is not a sprite and has actually a, a CGF with proxies in it, you can have proper rigid body collisions uh, if you set it to mesh. If you set it to particle, it will go through the cry physics system and will not uh, use the particle internal uh, collision. And this can be registered by code. You can check for collision on an entity and say like, oh, I got hit by this fire particle. And then you can do some logic that this thing takes damage or whatever. There's also other ways to spawn this kind of particle collisions uh, or basically doing raycasts from an entity system. Uh, if you want to do that. So you don't necessarily need to do this raycast inside the particle. Uh, in Hunt we do it actually, we do separate the damage volume from the visual effect. The visual effect is only there to make the fire go, uh, but the player takes actually damage by a different system that's a volume, which is uh, pretty much the same volume as the fire would distribute. So um, just for real reliability sake, because this kind of things, especially if you go multiplayer with this, if you want to keep things in sync, particles are not designed to stay in sync. Like you have randomization factors like noise modifiers and random modifi modifications, you will not get the same result all the time. So you have to be aware of that. Uh, don't rely on it too much. It should be only visual uh, representation of it. So you can, you can use more of it, but we are not um, promoting it too much. With the same system, when we collided, we, you can spawn a decal. Except this plane you would just replace with render decal and you spawn a decal material there and you have some kind of burned out patch or something.